To Kill a Mockingbird, Chapter 30, Page 363. A quick reminder that um, Scout has just discovered that it is Boo Radley standing in her brother's room, and it is Boo Radley who rescued them from Bob Ewell during the attack. Okay, here we go. Mr. Arthur, honey, said Atticus, gently correcting me. Jean Louise, this is Mr. Arthur Radley. I believe he already knows you. If Atticus could blandly introduce me to Boo Radley at a time like this, well, that was Atticus. Boo saw me run instinctively to the bed where Jem was sleeping, for the same shy smile crept across his face. Hot with embarrassment, I tried to cover up by covering Jem up. Ah, ah, don't touch him, Atticus said. Mr. Hectate sat looking intently at Boo through his horn-rimmed glasses. He was about to speak when Dr. Reynolds came down the hall. Everybody out, he said as he came in the door. Evening, Arthur. Didn't notice you the first time I was here. Dr. Reynolds's voice was as breezy as a step, as though he had said it every evening of his life, an announcement that astounded me even more than being in the same room with Boo Radley. Of course, even Boo Radley got sick sometimes, I thought, but on the other hand, I wasn't sure. Dr. Reynolds was carrying a big package wrapped in newspaper. He put it down on Jem's desk and took off his coat. You're quite satisfied he's alive now? Tell you how I knew. When I tried to examine him, he kicked me. Had to put him out good and proper to touch him. So scat, he said to me. Uh, said Atticus, glancing at Boo. Heck, let's go out on the front porch. There are plenty of chairs out there, and it's still warm enough. I wondered why Atticus was inviting us to the front porch instead of the living room. And then I understood. The living room lights were awfully strong. We filed out. First Mr. Tate. Atticus was waiting at the door for him to go ahead of him. And then he changed his mind and followed Mr. Tate. People have a habit of doing everyday things, even under the oddest conditions. I was no exception. Come along, Mr. Arthur, I heard myself saying. You don't know the house real well. I'll just take you to the porch, sir. He looked down at me and nodded. I led him through the hall and past the living room. Won't you have a seat, Mr. Arthur? This rocking chair is nice and comfortable. My small fantasy about him was alive again. He would be sitting on the porch. Right pretty spell we're having, isn't it, Mr. Arthur? Yes. A right pretty spell. Feeling slightly unreal, I led him to the chair farthest from Atticus and Mr. Tate. It was in deep shadow. Boo would feel more comfortable in the dark. Atticus was sitting in the swing, and Mr. Tate was in a chair next to him. The light from the living room windows was strong on them. I sat beside Boo. Well, heck, Atticus was saying, I guess the thing to do... Good Lord, I'm losing my memory. Atticus pushed up his glasses and pressed his fingers to his eyes. Jem's not quite 13. No, wait, he's already 13. I can't remember. Anyway, it'll come before county court. What will, Mr. Finch? Mr. Tate uncrossed his legs and leaned forward. Of course, it was clear-cut self-defense, but I'll have to go to the office and hunt up. Mr. Finch! Do you think Jem killed Bob Yule? Do you think that? You heard what Scout said. There's no doubt about it. She said Jem got up and yanked him off of her. He probably got a hold of Yule's knife somehow in the dark. We'll find out tomorrow. Okay, this is a good pausing point. We, when we looked at that play-by-play, -play, determined that it couldn't have been Jem that yanked Bob off of Scout. So Atticus isn't mistaken very often, but here he is. We know it was not Jem who killed Bob Ewell. We know it was Boo. But he doesn't get that. So what you have to understand is he doesn't understand that. And Hectate has to try to convince him, no, 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 no. It wasn't Jem. But, kind of a twist here, Hectate also doesn't tell him that it was Boo. So check this out. Mr. Finch, hold on, said Mr. Tate. Jem never stabbed Bob Yule. Atticus was silent for a moment. 
He looked at Mr. Tate as if he appreciated what he said, but Atticus shook his head. Heck, it's mighty kind of you, and I know you're doing it from that good heart of yours, but don't start anything like that. Okay, this is another good place to stop and think. What does Atticus think Hectate's doing? I'll give you a hint. He thinks he's doing him a favor of some kind. So if Atticus truly believes that Jem killed Bob, and now he thinks that Hectate is doing him some sort of favor, kind of put two and two together there. Mr. Tate got up and went to the edge of the porch. He spat into the shrubbery and then thrust his hands into his hip pockets and faced Atticus. Like what? he said. I'm sorry if I spoke sharply, Heck, Atticus said simply, but nobody's hushing this up. I don't live that way. Nobody's going to hush anything up, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate's voice was quiet, but his boots were planted so solidly on the porch floorboards it seemed that they grew there. A curious contest, the nature of which eluded me, was developing between my father and the sheriff. So Scout doesn't really understand what's going on here, but hopefully at this point you do. Atticus thinks Jem killed Bob. Heck is saying, no, that didn't happen. Atticus is saying, no, 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 no. You're not going to cover Jem's self-defense murder up for me. We don't live like that. And so that's where we're at. Bottom of 365 going on the top of 366. It was Atticus's turn to get up and go to the edge of the porch. He said, hmm, and spat dryly into the yard. He put his hands in his pockets and faced Mr. Tate. Heck, you haven't said it, but I know what you're thinking. Thank you for it. Jean Louise, he turned to me. You said Jem yanked Mr. Yule off you. Yes, sir, that's what I thought. I, You see there, Heck? Thank you. From the bottom of my heart, but I don't want my boy starting out with something like this over his head best way to clear the air is to have it all out in the open. Let the county come and bring sandwiches. I don't want him growing up with a whisper about him. I don't want anybody saying, Jem Finch, his daddy paid a mint to get him out of that. The sooner we get this over with, the better. Good stopping point there. Atticus may as well have said, I don't want him growing up like Boo Radley, right? Boo Radley grew up with a secret about him. And look what happened to him. Because there was something unknown, people started all of these rumors. So because Atticus believes that Jem really killed Bob Yule, he says, no, 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 we're going to tell the truth. We're going to let people see exactly what happened, and we're going to move on. But again, Hectate's like, no, 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 that's not what happened. Now, you know from watching the movie and from us talking about it, that Boo Radley killed Bob Yule. But look what Mr. Tate says next on the middle of page 366. Mr. Finch... Mr. Tate said stolidly. Bob Yule fell on his knife. He killed himself. Atticus walked to the corner of the porch. He looked at the wisteria vine. In his own way, I thought, each was as stubborn as the other. I wondered who would give in first. Atticus's stubbornness was quiet and rarely evident, but in some ways he was as set as the Cunninghams. Mr. Tate's was unschooled and blunt, but it was equal to my father's. Heck, Atticus's back was turned. If this thing's hushed up, it'll be a simple denial to Jem of the way I've tried to raise him. Sometimes I think I'm a total failure as a parent, but I'm all they've got. Before Jem looks at anyone else, he looks at me. And I've tried to live so I can look squarely back at him. If I connived at something like this, frankly, I couldn't meet his eye. And the day I can't do that, I'll know I've lost him. I don't want to lose him and Scout because they're all I've got. Mr. Finch, Mr. Tate was still planted to the floorboards. Bob Ewell fell on his knife. I can prove it. Okay, we're going to stop there and think about this. You can prove that he didn't. What piece of evidence from the last chapter would you use to prove that, no, 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 Bob Ewell did not fall, fall on his knife. He couldn't have. Think hard. Top of page 367. Atticus wheeled around. His hands dug into his pockets. Heck, can't you even try to see it my way? You've got children of your own, but I'm older than you. When mine are grown, I'll be an old man if I'm still around, but right now I'm... If they don't trust me, they won't trust anybody. Jem and Scout know what happened. If they hear me saying downtown something different happened, heck, I won't have them anymore. I can't live one way in town and another way in my home. Mr. Tate rocked on his heels and said patiently, 
He'd flung Jem down. He stumbled over a root under that tree, and look, I can show you. Mr. Tate reached in his side pocket and withdrew a long switchblade knife. Now, this is a good place to pause and underline. He brought out a switchblade. Now, maybe he's a guy who just carries a switchblade, but maybe he's not. And if he's not, then that's something to think about. Harper Lee wants us to sort of gloss over that, so she distracts us for a minute. As he did so, Dr. Reynolds came to the door. The son of a... Deceased's under that tree, doctor, just inside the schoolyard. You got a flashlight? Better have this one. I can ease around and turn my car lights on, said Dr. Reynolds. But he took Mr. Tate's flashlight. Jem's all right. He won't wake up tonight, I hope, so don't worry. Is that the knife that killed him, heck? Uh, no, sir. Still in him. Looked like a kitchen knife. You may want to circle that in your own book. From the handle. Ken ought to be there with a the hearse by now. Doc. Ken ought to be there with a the hearse by now, doctor. Good night. Okay. The kitchen knife is the murder weapon. Okay? So that's important. Mr. Tate goes back to his demonstration here, bottom of 367. Mr. Tate flicked open the knife. It was like this, he said. He held the knife and pretended to stumble. And as he leaned forward, his left arm went down in front of him. See there? Stabbed himself through that soft stuff between his ribs. His whole weight drove it in. Again, go back to the evidence from that last chapter. What's wrong with Hectate's story here? Mr. Tate closed the knife and jammed it back in his pocket. Scout is eight years old, he said. She was too scared to know exactly what went on. <laughs> You'd be surprised, Atticus said grimly. I'm not saying she made it up. I'm saying she was too scared to know exactly what happened. It was mighty dark out there, black as ink, and it takes somebody mighty used to the dark to make a competent witness. Okay, so before you go to the next line and you see Atticus's reaction, who's he talking about? Somebody mighty used to the dark. Who's the character in the book who we know doesn't come out of the house, who we know can see well in the dark because he rescued Jeb and Scout? Remember, Boo is sitting on the porch with them during this whole conversation. I won't have it, Atticus said softly. God damn it! I'm not thinking of Jem. Mr. Tate's boot hit the floorboard so hard, the lights in Miss Maudie's bedroom went on. Miss Stephanie Crawford's lights went on. Atticus and Mr. Tate looked across the street and then at each other. They waited. When Mr. Tate spoke again, his voice was barely audible. Mr. Finch, I hate to fight you when you're like this. You've been under a strain tonight no man should ever have to go through. Why you ain't in bed from it, I don't know, but I do know that for once you haven't been able to put two and two together, and we gotta settle this tonight because tomorrow it'll be too late. Bob Ewell's got a kitchen knife in his craw. Mr. Tate added that Atticus wasn't going to stand there and maintain that any boy Jem size with a busted arm had fight enough left in him to tackle and kill a grown man in the pitch dark. Heck, said Atticus abruptly, that was a switchblade you were waving. Where'd you get it? took it off a drunk man, Mr. Tate answered coolly. Okay, if you were looking for important details on this page, something to draw a conclusion from, it'd be this. He took a switchblade off of a drunk man. We know a drunk man who is mentioned in this chapter. Is it possible that the switchblade came from that famous drunk man? And if it is, then what's the significance of Hectate having it? What's the significance of the kitchen knife that killed Bob Yule? I was trying, this bottom of 368, I was trying to remember. Mr. Yule was on me, and then he went down. Jem must have gotten up. At least I thought. Heck, I said I took it off a drunk man downtown tonight. Yule probably found that kitchen knife in the dump somewhere, honed it down and bided his time, just bided his time. Atticus made his way to the swing and sat down. His hands dangled limply between his knees. He was looking at the floor. He'd moved with the same slowness that night in front of the jail when I thought it took him forever to fold his newspaper and toss it in his chair. Mr. Tate clumped softly around the porch. It ain't your decision, Mr. Finch. It's all mine. 
It's my decision and my responsibility, and for once, if you don't see it my way, there's not much you can do about it. You want to try, I'll call you a liar to your face. Your boy never stabbed Bob Ewell, he said slowly. Didn't come near a mile of it, and now you know it. All he wanted to do was get him and his sister safely home. Mr. Tate stopped pacing. He stopped in front of Atticus, and his back was to us. I'm not a very good man, sir, but I am sheriff of Maycomb County. I lived in this town all my life, and I'm going on 43 years old. I know everything that's happened here since before I was born. There's a black boy dead for no reason, and the man responsible for it's dead. Let the dead bury the dead this time, Mr. Finch. Let the dead bury the dead. Okay, that's a good place to annotate in your book as well. So the black boy is Tom. He's dead for no reason because he didn't do anything wrong. The man responsible for Tom's death is Bob, who is now dead. So let's look at that sentence. Let the dead bury the dead this time, Mr. Finch. What he means is Tom died for no reason. That's Bob's fault. Let's just not blame anybody for Bob's death. Now you need to start thinking about why don't they want to bring Boo Radley out as a hero? Why don't they want to parade him around and say, Boo Radley, hey, he's not as bad as we thought. He saved the kids' lives. So you need to think about that question. Hectate's going to talk a little bit about it here at the bottom of this page. Mr. Tate went to the swing and picked up his hat. It was lying beside Atticus. Mr. Tate pushed back his hair and put his hat on. I never heard tell that it's against the law for a citizen, okay, he's talking about Boo here, to do his utmost to prevent a crime from being committed, which is exactly what he did. But maybe you'll say it's my duty to tell the town all about it, not hush it up. You know what had happened then? All the ladies in Maycomb, including my wife, would be knocking on his door, bringing angel food cakes. To my way of thinking, Mr. Finch, taking the one man who's done you in this town a great service, and dragging him with his shy ways into the limelight, to me, that's a sin. It's a sin, and I'm not about to have it on my head. If it was any other man, it'd be different. But not this man, Mr. Finch. Mr. Tate was trying to dig a hole in the floor with the toe of his boot. He pulled his nose, then he massaged his left arm. I may not be much, Mr. Finch, but I'm still sheriff of Maycomb County, and Bob Ewell fell on his knife. Good night, sir. Mr. Tate stamped off the porch and strode away across the front yard. His car door slammed, and he drove away. Atticus sat looking at the floor for a long time. Finally, he raised his head. Scout, he said. Mr. Ewell fell on his knife. Can you possibly understand? Atticus looked like he, need, he needed cheering up. I ran to him and hugged him and kissed him with all my might. Yes, sir, I understand, I reassured him. Mr. Tate was right. Atticus disengaged himself and looked at me. What do you mean? Well, it'd be sort of like shooting a mockingbird, wouldn't it? Atticus put his face in my hair and rubbed it. When he got up and walked across the porch into the shadows, his youthful step had returned. And before he went inside the house, he stopped in front of Boo Radley. Thank you for my children, Arthur, he said.